Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka... Today we're talking about Yu-Gi-Oh! formats. Yu-Gi-Oh! formats are impermanent, to borrow a phrase from Yu-Gi-Oh! They only exist for a short period of time, and since there's 55,000 legal cards at any given time in Yu-Gi-Oh!, frequently that means that formats go unsolved. In fact, almost every single format that's received historic attention, things like Edison or Goat, has changed dramatically from how it was played at the time. So today I'm asking you what formats changed as a result of increased attention once people started taking them more seriously. In 2000. In 2012, it was widely understood that there were only a couple of decks you could be playing, and one of them was Dark World. Now, Dark World historically flopped on release, was not able to convert at the YCS after which it was released, but using modern deck building principles, we found that a significant amount of those formats, pretty much in a row, the best thing you could be playing by a country mile is Dark World. That's because previous Dark World builds are like loaded up on conditional traps and like occasionally make it to Graffa. But nowadays, we would just throw in, like, Into the Void, Upstart Goblin, and maybe three Skill Drain and call it a day. Like, it is unbelievable that our understanding that Dark World isn't good comes from a bunch of people who were registering decks with Dimensional Prison in it. Anyway, let's see what you all have come up with. Goat! Uh, a probably one of the best answers in the thread. A lot of this has to do with increased understanding of deck building and game knowledge, but Modern Goat is a completely different format compared to the original incarnation. Chaos Control used to be considered the end-all be-all, now it's like the seventh best deck. So Goat format is populated largely, historically, by a bunch of exceptionally slow control decks. This is because the top players have the ability to, like Magic the Gathering, out-resource their opponents over the course of a long game, doing a death by a thousand cuts type of thing. These days we recognize the power of disrespect, and in a format that includes cards like Giant Trunade, you might as well be trying a jammy-ass combo deck where you've got a couple of draw steps to get things going before your opponent is able to mount any sort of offensive. At the most recent Goat Control event, the top two slots were taken up by this, which is a combination of like Cat Combo and Panda Burn, if you're familiar with those decks. Uh, you would use Rescue Cat to summon a couple of copies of Gyaku Gire Panda, and then you would flip up like Ojama Trio, and then the Gyaku Gire Pandas would get really big and be able to pierce and walk over the Ojama cards and do a bazillion damage, all facilitated by the fact that Last Will is inexplicably at three during this format. This is a really powerful strategy for sure, and uh, is one of the reasons why the GOAT format All-Stars have really been bumped down to Tier 2 status at best. Almost the entirety of 2006. At this point, Cyberstein had been reprinted in Dark Beginnings 2 and the Sidra Fusions were legal, but it wasn't until mid to late 2006 that people realized Cyberstein should be a splash in everything, causing an e-ban in December of 2006. I'm gonna be honest with you, post-GOAT deck building is really, really bad. It's unfortunate because it did contain one of the most broken cards in the history of time, Cyberstein. At a time when Last Will was legal, you could really easily tribute for a monarch, activate Last Will, go Cyberstein into... Uh, Cyber Twin Dragon and just dome your opponent for a bazillion damage. Uh, an interaction that basically ruined Reaper format when we took a look at it a couple of years later. Fairies! Only recently in Edison have people realized Christia is a hell of a boss monster backed by the mini Heralds and Honest. Mix in some Chaos and Dimensional Alchemist with a good DM band stuff and it makes a hell of a board to break. So we are going to probably have to talk about Edison four or five times over the course of this thread. Not only was Edison a historically unexplored, extremely fun format, it has gone through stages of being unexplored as a modern retro format as well. At the end of the day, despite the fact that the format has transformed pretty radically, there's like maybe 500 total playable cards in the format. Like cards that you would consider slotting into your deck under any circumstance. Edison hits the sweet spot for me of low enough power level that a lot of shit isn't gate kept by like build a board combo decks and expansive enough card pool that there are a lot of extremely playable cards we just did not ever see throughout the entirety of the format. Aries is a perfect example of that. It includes a significant amount of cards that are just straight up baller. Christia, of course, is the heart and soul of the deck, um, but maybe even more important, Dimensional Alchemist, no one, I mean N-O-O-N-E, had to spell it in my head real quick, was playing Nova Herald. No one was playing Shining Angel in 2010, and it turns out that they're potentially top-tier meta threats just because of how they interact with that series of cards. The Heralds were considered as part of, like, the Herald deck, uh, but supplementing them, like, just playing a critical mass of them and being able to find them over the course of a long game is actually crazy strong. Real Edheads know that Zombie, as an engine or pure, was popularized after Keegan held a special Halloween-themed tournament in 2021. This sounds stupid and like there's no way that this is how it happened but it is 100% true for a significant amount of time zombies were imagined to be kind of a mid edison deck 
And then Keegan held a Halloween event in which there was not only a prize for winning, but a prize for the zombie player who went the farthest, you know, for like Halloween, right? Well, a zombie player ended up winning. And as a result, people kind of took another look at the archetype and recognized, holy shit, Goblin Zombie is basically a card that should have been printed in 2020, but is randomly legal in 2010. The way that it and Pyramid Turtle interact with Mizuki is crazy. This card doesn't miss timing, so if sent to the graveyard with a uh, D.Va to make a Brionic, you can do some truly heinous shit and uh, the rest is history. Now Zombies is like a top tier thing you can put in a deck. Another great example is Welladad. Yes, Welladad was only brewed within the last year because people only discovered Power Well exists. I don't think this is necessarily true. I mean, people knew this card existed from a couple of like progression series style things uh, beforehand, but I think Keegan making it his baby is responsible for a lot of people thinking the deck is playable. Getting in on the ground floor to be one of the billions to say Edison. We are back to Edison. This person's name, by the way, MBT Reply Guy at Joey Wheeler Vivo. Incredible name. It's kind of interesting how sparsely available some cards were back in the day compared to now and how that specifically has led people to discover a lot of new strats. So certainly a significant amount of the cards that ruin old formats, Cyberstein specifically is a great example, were just not as available as cards are available nowadays, which means that people had less of an opportunity to test with them, especially during times when there wasn't like dueling network available. A lot of the reason a lot of these like pre-2012 formats are so unexplored is because people didn't really have the tools to explore them. Fire water format. Turns out the best decks were neither fire nor water. Yeah. So fire water format is well known for uh, Mermail and uh, Brotherhood of the Fire Fist Bear. <laughs> no, Fire Fists in general. Um, this is because a significant amount of pro players were convinced that Mermail was the best deck. It had a high skill cap. There was a lot you could do with each individual hand. It was a Johnny combo player's dream. Fire Fist was a part of the format because it was the easier deck. Um, the understanding of Yu-Gi-Oh formats at the time was that there would be one big ass combo deck. And there'd be one deck that normal summons one card and then sets four. And this was that one. It had a pretty good matchup spread as well versus the decks that people were playing. But with modern deck building principles, we have discovered the best decks are neither of these. They are, they're not, they're not the best decks in this format. Let me just read you off the top four from uh, Wolf02, which I believe is the most recent uh, Firewater format event. Uh, first place was Gadget playing Tin Goldfish. Second place was Bujin. Third place was Dark World. And fourth place was, no, there's no way this is real. It was fucking trick or treat. Ghost trick Madolce. Meowmix says, while the control resource loops of hat format are still powerful and kind of the reason the format is remembered fondly, hindsight has shown that balls to the wall combo decks like Sylvan were clearly the best things you could be playing. Correct. So Hand Artifact Trap Tricks is an incredibly well-loved deck. It is also incredibly slow. It plays cards like these that you set and wait for your opponent to crash into in order to advance your own game plan. It plays back row that has to be uh, set up over the course of a couple of turns and popped with other back row or your opponent accidentally popping stuff in order to get any value off of. In practice, there are a number of decks in this format that are just unbelievably unbeatable 2020 style combo decks. The most popular of these, of course, is Sylvan, but this one's weird because not only do we know now that Sylvan is good, we knew back then too. In fact, a group of professional players kept the deck fully realized and actualized under wraps until the WCQ season when they could basically bust it out and sweep. So this is a really old profile of Cody Angeloff playing Sylvans at a TCG player $2,500 tournament. And this is like the first Sylvan top there is. Uh, I don't know why, but basically uh, they had scouted out this TCG player tournament as the testing ground for this deck for the WCQ season. And as a result, like this random fucking TCG player event was suddenly stormed by this deck that no one was prepared for right before the biggest tournament of the year. It was so sick. This is also a period in Yu-Gi-Oh's history where pro players were just lying to people. They would just like top with a deck that was suboptimal, hype it up in a deck profile to get other people net decking them, and then just play a deck like this. I don't know how true this is, but after talking to some people who played Dual historically, they said Teller Knight wasn't as good as people thought back then. 100% correct. Teller Knight is one of the most overhyped decks of all time. It was not competitive versus the other Duelist Alliance decks, in my opinion. 
it represents an old world style of deck building, which is understandable because Duelist Alliance is like the point in which Yu-Gi-Oh changed from being like a big fuck off combo fest uh, to being like, I'm going to set four back row and hope for the best. So Teller Knight was the last really good deck that set four back row and hoped for the best. Like normal summoned a Deneb and was like, I'll get him next turn. I feel like DDD has to be mentioned. It was strong in the OCG. Everybody hyped it up. It saw maybe a week of viability before Zodiac was released and completely took over the format. Want to go a little deeper into this one. DDD was forecasted to be the best deck by a country mile after the release of DD Lamia. It was not. Um, people talk about Zodiac like it was the reason that DDD was not competitive. And while certainly Zodiac overshadowed everything before it, I'd argue DDD wasn't really that competitive beforehand either. Certainly it was a top tier deck, maybe even the best deck, but not the best deck by such a margin that people had predicted because there were just other interactive combo decks in that format. Like if you have to open a specific four card hand to end on four pieces of interaction DDD, or you can play Metal Foes, which ends on two, plus the ability to play past turn one, plus it never bricks, like that's a pretty easy call. Coder leads with a very interesting one. Striker Orcus was a playable deck for so long during toss format, and it wasn't until much later near the end of the format the deck was discovered. It turned out to be much stronger than any of the toss decks pure. So this is kind of true. Oh, literally Jesse Cotton is in this thread saying the same thing. It wasn't good until Chaos Impact. There were two events that should have been played but hadn't been discussed, but it was definitely not good that whole time. This is an MBT callout, but definitely Runic being a viable deck. Certainly I got Runic wrong because I expected it to be played like it was in the OCG where it was like largely a mill condition and didn't make too much of a splash. We just played it as 20 instant fusions. I feel like we are currently mid-realization about furniture, aka IKEA Labyrinth. Me too. Although, you could argue that the reason that IKEA Labyrinth is good is because Droll started being played as a result of Super Heavy Samurai being released and being very good, and it's a monster combo deck that doesn't lose to Droll. But it is interesting that about a month and a half ago, we were all convinced the only possible way you could play Labyrinth in any sort of competitive capacity was three big lady and 37 trap cards. And now we're playing what? Nine traps total and trying to like make Chaos Angel and associated eight star synchros turn one. It's very funny. Master Duel Entry. For a long time in NR format, we played with Megalith and Metal Foes as the de facto best decks. Then we started interacting with the Japanese NR player base, and we learned Vendred was absolutely broken, and we just hadn't tried it enough. So I think that there's a lot in NR that's really powerful and unexplored just because the player base is smaller and there's a lot of legal cards that people can't identify at a glance. But Vendred is one of the most independently difficult archetypes to place in the history of time. It's just like all the cards do stuff that is hard to conceptualize and as a result um it's it's difficult to engage with just how strong this archetype can be are we getting nr part two something maybe a little different the speedrun community for the sacred cards a 2002 game boy advance game was broken wide open three years ago when people discovered how to properly manipulate the rng to ftk every single time with destiny board hell yes not exactly the format I was talking about, but we'll take it. I think now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can recognize that not only were a lot of formats that we thought were bad actually secretly good, a lot of formats we thought were good were actually secretly bad. Thankfully, I don't think any of this is going to happen for the most recent format, because no one's ever going to play that shit again. Speedroid. <laughs> Speedroid. He's so real for this.